to uh, lecture number four. Hopefully you liked a little bit of a literature lesson with the Hamlet there in the intro, uh, but we are focusing on the human anatomy of the skull, sinuses, and cranial nerves today. This is in chapters seven and nine in your textbook, so make sure you're looking at that. Uh, but what I like best about uh, this first slide that we're starting off with is that it's got a lot of different colors where you can see each bone uh, because when I first learned the skull, I thought, okay, maybe seven, eight bones total, but we're talking 30, 40 bones uh, fused together to where they don't look like separate bones quite often, but they definitely are. So the skull is broken up into two main craniums. We've got the neurocranium, which neuro, think brain. That's the part of the skull that's gonna cover the brain itself. And then the viscerocranium, which is more like the facial aspect. So here you can see all the bones that make up the neurocranium, as well as the ones that make up the visceral cranium of the skull. I also want to focus you in to a lot of different things to know on here. For example, probably don't know, don't need to know a lot of these things, but they are extra, but you will need to think, know things like the inferior concha, the mental foramen, protuberances, symphysis, but I want to just kind of cross off a couple on here that you will not be able or need to know. The other key aspect of learning the skull is that you learn it from multiple views. So now we can see a lateral view from the side as well as a frontal view down here just like we saw on slide one. So now we can see things like the temporal bone, the parietal bone, occipital bone, and frontal, uh, in addition to the visceral cranium in the front. So I'm, I'm not gonna go through all the, the bones on here. You've got the book, you've got a couple of videos to kind of aid you, but I will note a few key things. For example, the skull cap is technical, technically called the calviera. So skull cap, calviera, and that's within the neurocranium. Now the joints are called sutures. So these suture joints, they fuse together the bones so that they stay really, really strong. Check out this video down here to see the lacrimal, ethmoid, and sphenoid because those are bones that are deep within, it's called the orbit of the eye. So not just the eye socket, but the orbit of the eye. Next up, we can remove the skull cap. So if I did that on this model here, remove the skull cap and I've placed a brain inside just to show you how nicely the brain fits in there. And remove the brain itself. You can notice there's a lot of area or smoothness to it to where the brain would sit. But remember, there's always meninges covering the brain 
to protect it from the base of the skull. Looking down here though, the different divisions are separated for the inside or the deeper portions of the base of the skull where the brain would sit, as well as over here, you've got an inferior view. So imagine this, turning it up, and now that looks very similar to that picture on the left. Take a minute and watch this video. This is a full skull video going through all the bones and take some time before you move forward to draw this out, print out an unlabeled picture and label these bones. There's no way of getting around uh, the skull bones. You just got to know uh, these moving forward. And here we are looking at the sutures of the skull itself. And we've got a lot of words on here, like eminent to the suture and process, condyle. If you're unfamiliar with those medical terms, jump back to page 11 in your textbook and list those out. Uh, those will help you in a lot of what we're going to go through with the bones moving forward. But notice we've got things like the sagittal suture it's running parallel to the sagittal plane, the lambdoid suture, which separates the occipital from the parietals, and then a spot called the lambda, lambda, where those two sutures come together. Now, if you're thinking about the weak spot, the vulnerable spot on the skull, that's one of them because that's kind of like three joints coming together and it's the most weak portion of the back of the skull. Now you also have the coronal suture up front here, parallel to the coronal plane. I love when those things match up and you have the brigma, which is where those three come together. Be able to name the suture, name those two special ones that we talked about where they come together, as well as what does each suture separate? Verbal question for your professional groups this week is what is the suture separating the temporal and parietal bones? I'll say it again, what suture separates the temporal and parietal bones? Now with the skull, we've got to talk about fractures of the skull. So someone falls, hits their head, car accident, whatever it might be, you might see a lot of this in the ER at the hospital. Five main types that you can see over here. Uh, linear is the most common. So linear is the most frequent, frequent and you can see it down here as just kind of a, a fracture. Uh, straight across. But next up, we've got the depra or depressed one where you can see it's pushing in on the skull itself. Comminuted. Comminuted is kind of like the new word for compound. So when we used to say compound, we meant different pieces broken up. Now the word is comminuted. And it's often a result of coup and counter coup. And I want you guys to look that up, what those words mean specifically to how that would produce that type of fracture. Number four, basal fracture. Down here, you can see it doesn't quite break the bone fully, but there's been damage to the bone uh, down in there. And it can have leakage of that CSF, second time here in CSF, definitely one you want to remember as that CSF, if it's in the wrong spot, can definitely cause some damage. And lastly, you might be thinking, uh, Terion, silent P, fracture, where is that? Well, let me minimize my box here, and now you can see the Terion is where all these sutures come together. So notice, that black circle is a pterion number five, very life-threatening for this type of fracture. 
life-threatening because again, it's where all the sutures are coming together. Anytime you have a bunch of sutures coming together, it's a vulnerable spot to be in. Continuing on with the skull, as we go more superficial, so the scalp would be superficial and the skull itself would be deep. Let's look at the scalp and the five different layers of the scalp. First off, skin. Skin is most superficial. It's got the arteries, the veins, lymphatics. Next is a layer of connective tissue. And if you look up here, you can see those different layers. Third layer, third most superficial, is called the aponeurosis. When you think of aponeurosis, I want you to think of a thick, tendinous sheath of connective tissue. Uh, in this case, it's called the epicranial aponeurosis. It's shown up top here as this middle part, because as we'll find out, there's actually a muscle in the back called the occipitalis and a muscle in the front called the frontalis. In the middle, you've got that epicranial aponeurosis. Number four, another layer, but this one's a loose connective layer of tissue. It allows for a little bit of movement of all the layers. And then finally, the pericranium, which is dense connective tissue, the most deep layer of the scalp uh, before you get to the skull itself. So luckily, scalp has an acronym that will tell you the five layers in order from superficial to deep be able to reverse the order and go deep to superficial or superficial to deep. So now that we've learned the general anatomy, what can go wrong? Well, mainly with the scalp, it's an infection. Typically in the loose connective tissue layer, which would be referred to as a danger area. And you've got pus or blood that spreads and infection that can show itself as a symptom like a black eye. But in this case, it's uniform on both sides and you can see discoloration or purple patches. All right, before we go to the next slide, we're gonna do a quick review because we're gonna get into the meanges surrounding the brain but take 20 seconds and write out the meanges of the brain on a blank piece of paper. Let's go superficial to deep. Give me the three meanges of the brain. I'll give you 10 seconds to uh, do that. And, and for sure, pause the video. But what are the three meanges from superficial to deep? All right, couple more seconds. I'm gonna hold up the answer here from superficial to deep. The meanges are dura mater, arachnoid mater, pia mater. So if you got that, you're in good shape. We're gonna add more information to it. And here we are. You can see the three layers again but always look for new information. So we've got the first most superficial going down to the deepest, but we got a new word at the bottom. The new word is leptomenix. Leptomenix means pia mater and arachnoid mater together. Because believe it or not, they're actually smashed together to where they often stick together like one layer. Whereas a dura mater, is much more noticeable by itself. And if you've watched the video, you definitely know the dura mater has two layers to it. Here's the first one, the per, or periosteal layer and the meningeal layer. Periosteal layer is gonna be closer to the bone or the skull, and the meningeal layer is gonna be closer to the other meninges. Here's a great shot of a, a GIF showing the dura, arachnoid, and pia, and then with none of the meanges on there, as was well another picture over here. If you're still working through this and getting to the level of knowing these and kind of just even visualizing it, I did find another video that's not my personal YouTube video, 
but it's got a uh, a video, quick kind of dry erase marker video, whatever, of the Mianjis that could help you out. Looking real specifically at the Dura, again, remember we just said it's one layer periosteal closer to the periosteum, as well as to the meningeal layer closer to the other meanges. Now notice up here, the blue stuff, those are all the veins traveling through the brain. So we're gonna add in the systems. These systems in the body are not separate. They are all together, but we often study them separately and then piece them back together. All right. And you might be wondering, why would I put the veins on here? Well, the veins will have cerebral spinal fluid drain into it. So let me give you a little bit more on cere or cerebral spinal fluid. And down here at the bottom, you can see that when cerebral spinal fluid is produced, it's hanging out in the subarachnoid space. So imagine the space that I'm kind of drawing in right now filled with CSF. But that CSF, it can't last forever. It's got to be recycled and new CSF has to come in. And, and that CSF actually cushions that part of the brain. So what happens is the CSF travels through what are called arachnoid granulations and go into the dural venous sinus. That dural venous sinus is one of the largest veins in the skull that drains that CSF back into the blood stream. Now do note up here, I've denoted a few of the ones that you want to know of the veins of the skull and the brain with a red line. So notice I'm kind of covering up the red line with a black line, but anything with a red line up here, you will want to know that in the brain. And what's kind of cool is that it acts as a gutter-like system to where it'll flow down the gutter like that. So whether you're on the right or the left, as we learn these, do note there's a flow through the venous system. All right, and here's another shot of it. This is the one from the video. So hopefully you're familiar with this model. Guaranteed picture of it on your exam. But here you can see the CSF floating around in that subarachnoid space, traveling on over, going up to the arachnoid granulation, also called arachnoid villi, and then into the dural venous sinus or the veins. So definitely know it from multiple perspectives. And here's another perspective of the same thing, but now we're looking at the brain as well as the spinal cord. So remember brain stem right here, spinal cord starts right down in here. The same Mianji layers are covering the spinal cord and it has a subarachnoid space as well. Later, we're gonna learn about a lumbar puncture that actually sticks a needle into the spinal cord area, but not the spinal cord itself, just that subarachnoid space as shown here, and then pulls out CSF, which can be used for a variety, or a variety of things. So a goal I have for you is to figure out why would we ever need CSF clinically? What can it tell us about the body? Another thing to note before we move on is there's a giant artery right here and the arteries often go deep into the brain, just like the pia mater goes deep into the brain. So notice this pia mater layer goes deep down into here. So does this blood vessel. So red artery. Let's take a look at what that one's most likely going to be. So the main one that travels up into the skull, through the center of the skull, is the internal carotid artery. So think internal carotid artery is one of the main ways 
to get up through the skull itself into the brain. So here we are looking at one of the main arteries that takes blood up through the skull to the brain, and it's the <laughs> internal carotid artery. And you might be thinking carotid, that's like your, your pulse on the side of your neck, and that's true. And that takes blood up the skull, if we were to look here, through what's called the carotid canal to the brain itself. So again, we're gonna look at this closer. Why don't you start to visualize these blood vessels traveling up through the neck and to the brain itself. So back to the slideshow. Now we can see that internal carotid artery coming up and these photos really focus in on what would be this area where the internal carotid artery kind of does an S curve into the skull itself. So just noting there's that blood vessel as well as later on, we're gonna look in part two about the cranial nerves and they travel through the skull as well. So just a note, the skull has a ton of holes in it. Look at all those holes and I'll often use these pipe cleaners to stick through the skull so that you can see kind of where it's traveling. This slide is just showing the vasculature of the dura. Blood vessels have to get to all these different structures and the meningeal artery with different divisions to it will get to those things branching off of actually the external carotid artery. So internal is going deep to the brain, but external carotid, which we'll look at more later, think of it as the external scalp and meningeal layers. And we can't forget about the nervous system, cranial nerve five, which we'll see in a little bit, the trigeminal nerve deals with the sensation of the dura mater. So different pain can be associated with the dura, but often referred pain. This week in the professional groups, come up with reasons and clinical issues for the meninges, especially the dura mater and how it might cause headaches. Quick analogy slide of the dura mater to tinfoil and pia mater as saran wrap. Again, these things just helped me when I was a student or helped me when I was a student remember some of these layers and their functions. Here's a slide I'm not gonna cover because it kind of answers the headaches question, but I want you to use your problem solving abilities and be able to explain that back to me for why headaches could have dural origins. So as we continue on, we've talked about the layers. Now let's talk about the spaces in between. First off, we've got the epidural space. This one's huge in giving epidurals. So when you think of an epidural, think of anesthesia that could be given to uh, someone who is pregnant or other issues in the lower back uh, as the epidural space. Now epi meaning above, sub meaning below. So sub is underneath or deeper to the dura mater, but superficial to the arachnoid mater. And again, we've talked about the subarachnoid space with the CSF, start to really connect some of these things that have been repeated. The more times something is repeated, the more likely it is to be on an exam. So one of the last things we'll talk about with the skull and the meningi layers are hemorrhages. So hemorrhages dealing with uh, what's called a hematoma. So hematoma, hema, blood, think of it as 
one of those blood vessels going to the meninges, rupturing, whether it's from a, a fracture or something else, and producing pretty much a blood bubble. So we can see this forming right here. And this will put pressure down on the brain. It will put pressure on other things, nerves in that area. Three main ways that it can occur. First one, extradural. So this is you know, outside the dura mater. If this is the dura right here, we can see that this hematoma is on top of it or it's outside the meninges, extradural. Subdural, right here, now we can see the dura mater and then underneath it is the hematoma. And finally, subarachnoid space hemorrhages occur where we can see the dura, arachnoid, P is down here, so this would be your subarachnoid space filling up with the hemorrhage. Again, anytime you have a blow to the head or you know, an injury to the skull, make sure that that person gets evaluated for a hemorrhage. Because oftentimes when someone hits their head, it can feel like a headache, like a really bad headache. And then if they fall asleep, try to sleep it off, it oftentimes can be fatal because it's actually a hemorrhage putting unnecessarily stress on the brain and filling up more and more and more until it's fatal. So do not let that person fall asleep. Take them to the hospital to get further evaluated. Okay, done with the, uh, the skull with the meninges and now we're on to the nose. And with the nose, we're talking about a few main functions of the nose here. Now the nose can be the nasal bone, but we also know there's a lot of skin and connective tissue and elastic tissue in the nose itself. But the nose is built for bringing air in. So if you're not a nose breather, I would highly suggest trying it out because uh, one, it does smell, olfaction smell, but for breathing, it filtrates and humidifies the air. That is huge for getting the air in the proper condition before it gets to your lungs. Now I'm a mouth breather and I've had certain coughs and other things like that as it is related to mouth breathing. And some of the solutions to that is to become a nose breather. I'm gonna post a few articles online, but I want you guys to look up any research you can on nose breathing versus mouth breathing. So again, the nose is definitely the bony part with the nasal bones, part of the maxilla, part of the frontal bone, and then the nasal septum. And oftentimes we hear about a deviated septum. Well, that deviated septum is essentially a deviation to the septum, to where it's to the right too much or to the left, or maybe it's a squiggly line and it really causes issues with bringing in air and breathing. But then we also have the cartilaginous part, which can dilate or constrict. Take a moment, maybe in the privacy of wherever you're at to kind of squint your nose and dilate the nasal um, area, as well as constrict to let less in. And again, if you're trying to smell something, you'd probably dilate. If you're trying to not smell something, you'd constrict. All right, here we can see an internal lateral view of the nasal cavity. So if you're looking at the nasal cavity, it's essentially this part right here. And within that, we can see things like the vestibulae and the external nares or the nostrils. Uh, but we also come in and can see things like the concha. So inferior concha, superior concha, and somewhere on there is the middle concha. 
but do note they've been cut. So this is not where it normally would be. It would also be out here. So this is inferior. This would be middle. This would be superior. Now, what do those do? Well, the inferior two thirds are responsible for respiration or respiratory things. Like we said, humidifying the air, uh, filtering the air. But the top one third, most superior, is going to deal with olfactory or smell. And why that is, is because you actually have these cranial nerves hanging down from where your brain would be up here into your nose. So we'll look at that later, but just know that's why the superior concha is for olfactory because it's closest to that cranial nerve. Also note something called the opening to the pharyngeal tympanic tube. That's coming from your ear. So I'm not great at drawing, but that is an ear or my best attempt at an ear. And we'll talk later about how when your ears pop, it's actually pressure changes coming from this tube. So if this is the nasal cavity. This would be the oral cavity down here, making this the maxilla. This would be the frontal bone. You know, start to put the skull bones in here. Uh, the hard palate right back in here. Frontal, ethmoid, sphenoid. So again, rough drawings, but you get the point that all these bones are coming together to make these areas. All right, last part to talk about with this video are the sinuses. So sinuses, think of it as like kind of a hollow space in the skull. So these are hollow spaces and you can see we've got frontal, ethmoidal, sphenoidal, and maxillary. But do note that they have, um, they lighten the skull but they also produce mucus for the nasal cavity, which would be around this area. Now notice one of the uh, most distinct ones is this maxillary, which sits a little bit lower, a little bit more inferior than the other ones, right? Here we can see it on an x-ray, but we've all maybe experienced <coughs> our sinuses kind of filling out with too much mucus. We'll talk in our professional groups of why that might occur with diseases. The other thing you wanna note is the maxillary sinus is the most commonly infected. Again, it's the most inferior. And what happens is that the other ones often drain into there, but the drain for that one isn't necessarily straight down. It's off to the side. So what you'll have to do is tilt your head to the side or lie on your side while you sleep at night. And you might have experienced this where one side drains and you wake up and the other side's still clogged. So maybe halfway through the night, flip to the other side so that you can drain both sides. All right. Before we conclude this video, I just wanted to show a picture of a real human skull, not to scare you, but again, this is essentially the skull itself. And oftentimes models are manufactured really dense, but the human skull can definitely deteriorate and fracture and break uh, after someone's passed away. But in your actual skull, it's actually probably closer to uh, a model than some of the real skulls that you might see in a lab. But this concludes uh, lecture number four on the skull, sinuses, and cranial nerves. Check out part two for the rest of this PowerPoint.